to talk today about uh, mindfulness. And this has become a pretty hot term in the last few decades. Uh, I remember wandering through an airport, which is always an interesting experience as a monk. I believe some people tried to sell one of a fellow monk a, a perfume named Samsara. <laughs> and, but one nice thing was I did go into a bookstore, and, and there is you know, a whole section on spirituality and the different modes of mindfulness. And yet what that term has come to mean in modern parlance is uh, incomplete in the view of what the Buddha meant mindfulness to imply. You can see this happen in your own life is how the, over the years, those habit patterns accumulate uh, like spider webs laid, laid one over the other until you can feel as if what uh, you're interacting through the world is through a crust of perception and habit. And we all know people we've met, and maybe it's us too, who it seems like it's hard to find the spark of who they are below the surface. It's, it's hard to see their heart anymore. So this is what happens when mindfulness is gone. But when there is this quality of mindfulness which invokes awareness, which means you're present, then there's true life and an ability to peel back that sankhara and to strengthen the citta, what we call the heart, so that it shines through. Now, sati, which is mindfulness, is sometimes hard to define exactly. Uh, the root of the word sati is sar, which means to remember. It's this quality of remembering to be present is one way to put it, or to remember yourself in the scene where you are. And in some ways, I think it was Maharshi who said that your only choice in life is whether to be mindful or not. That's the only choice, because every other choice extends from there. And Yet, if we just uh, leave it at that, mindfulness can really be, be dismissed as this sort of vague uh, invocation of open, accepting awareness and nothing else. And uh, Bhante Sudhaso makes that comparison. Uh, samasati, right mindfulness, is one-eighth of the Eightfold Path. And if that's all we work with, it's a bit like someone asking us for a cake and we give them one-eighth of the cake, which is a bowl of eggs. So to really work with mindfulness, we need to place it within a broader Buddhist context. One important uh, aspect of that is to remember that in the Satipatthana Sutta, the foundations of mindfulness, kind of the seminal sutta where the Buddha outlines this practice of Satipatthana, of mindfulness and establishing mindfulness is the prelude, uh, which says, um, ardent, aware, and mindful, putting aside grief and distress or greed and distress for the world. One develops, my, uh, looks at the body in the body, mind or feelings and feelings, mind and mind, uh, dhamma categories as dhamma categories. Um, so this quality of ardent, alert, mindful. And every, uh, for mindfulness in a Buddhist context to be correct, it has to be paired with energy, effort, and wisdom. And that's what ardent and alert imply. Uh, ardent is this quality of energy, and alert is this quality of, of true wisdom being brought to bear. And seeing one's greed and dislike for the world as unwholesome and unnecessary and being able to put those aside. And only when that's done is one able, truly able to practice uh, mindfulness in a Buddhist sense. And the uh, quality of um, the four foundations that the Buddha laid out in the sutta is one looks at the body, in the body, um, the feeling tone of one's experience, uh, the mind state, and finally, dhamma categories. Um, 
which is basically looking at the mind uh, in terms of whether it's possessed by the hindrances, these blockages to calm, or the enlightenment factors, these brightening factors. And what this means is that instead of uh, mindfulness just being sort of a, just an open awareness, what mindfulness does is it connects our experience to a framework. And it's an overlay you place over your experience. So most of the time, the overlay we place over any experience, any one of these four things, how we relate to the body, how we relate to our feelings of like, dislike, neutral, boredom, how we relate to the mind in the sense of an aggravated mind or an agitated mind, is uh, we connect it to the idea of self. Um, this sense of a unchanging, threatened, delicate entity that needs to be protected in us and fed and put above all else. And it's the secret in, in Buddhism that uh, the self always forms in the shadow of desire and hatred and delusion. It's always forming there as an implicit assumption. So when we connect all of our experience back to the self, then all of our experience necessarily becomes used in service of that self. What do we want? What do we dislike? Who's threatening to us? So the framework that one brings with the Satipatthana is a completely different framework. You're not framing things or connecting your experience to the concept of self, but rather to uh, a series, of, a way of looking at things that the Buddha recommended. So the body in the body. This is how we look at the body, not in terms of self, but just as it is, just as a body. One perceives the body in the body. It sounds so simple that it's, it's easy to dismiss, but it's quite profound. You're taking the self and the implicit assumption of a self that needs to be fed or protected out of the picture and just looking at experience as it is in this moment. And this first foundation, uh, mindfulness of body, is what we'll try to get into today a bit. It's uh, the Buddha said that just as uh, all the ocean encompasses all the rivers that flow into it. Even so, mindfulness of body partakes of all, encompasses within itself all states there are that partake of true knowledge. And there's this irony that the most death-bound element of our personality, the body, which we can see age, which we can see fall apart, which we can see reach its limits, is uh, the path to transcendence by seeing through it and using it as a basis. The first foundation of mindfulness, mindfulness of the body, is as uh, large or as uh, comprehensive as all three of the later uh, foundations of feelings of mind and of Dhamma categories all put together. So it begins by uh, it's a, it, there's a, a list, basically, and the first in that list of contemplations one uses to place a different framework over experience is one uh, develops mindfulness of breathing. And the first four steps of the mindfulness of breathing sutta are laid out. Uh, one breathes uh, in and out, or one breathes in knowing uh, this is a long breath, one breathes out knowing this is a long breath. One breathes in knowing this is a short breath, one breathes out knowing this is a short breath. One breathes in, training thus, I will experience the whole body or become sensitive to the whole body. One breathes out, training thus, I will become sensitive to the whole body. One breathes in, training thus, I will calm the body, the bodily activity. One breathes out, training thus, I will calm the bodily activity. And learning to inhabit our bodies through breath meditation is one of the most uh, foundational starting points for our practice, and it's, it's very practical. Um, so one of the issues with how breath meditation has been taught in, uh, in modern circles is one is often told to simply bring awareness to a single point, say at the tip of the nose, and just use 
one's force of will to maintain awareness there of the full in-breath and out-breath. But as thinking, uh, as moderns who have been educated uh, in a system which encourages thinking, um, often our minds need more. They need uh, a meditative paradigm where they can play and develop interest and explore. The proper orientation towards meditation is not kind of this dry application of will, but rather an active and interested, playful exploration. And for that, you need to expand the paradigm, the domain of meditation beyond just the tip of the nose, because there's not a lot you can do with the tip of the nose. So this is why it's really useful to look at uh, how in these first steps, there is this third step of one becomes sensitive to the whole body. And this, in many ways, is the linchpin for, for really working breath meditation for a lot of moderns, is how do we re-inhabit and learn to explore our body? Uh, most of us, many of us, are kind of trapped in this area up above our neck. And how do we drop awareness into the torso and the whole body and re-inhabit its sense. And in Buddhism, this word breath, pana, is uh, also in what in Sanskrit is called prana. It's the wind energy. It's not just the breath at the nose. It's the sense of movement uh, throughout the body. So to do that, uh, most moderns need expedient means. Um, it's not often enough just to sit down and try to know the whole body. So really useful ways of approaching this are um, uh, qigong, uh, cold showers, exercise, whatever kind of drops you into the body and lets you re-inhabit it. Uh, there's a really good book called The Way of Energy, which is an amazing uh, book on qigong, which one can look into. But I'm personally the biggest fan of cold showers. And this clarifies the breath energy and drops awareness into the body. And then when one sits, one can uh, embark on a very systematic scan of the body to very purposefully re-inhabit it and keep the mind busy for a time. It's like before telling awareness to settle down at the nose and just stay put and shut up, you let it run around a bit. It's like letting this classroom full of screaming two, you know, second graders run around the yard a bit in a wholesome team building activity before you tell them to sit down and do a worksheet. So. There's a few techniques. Um, some are laid out in Ajahn Jeff's books and translations um, with each and every breath and keeping the breath in mind. Ajahn Suchito's book, Breathing Like a Buddha, which is free online, uh, is an amazing guide. But perhaps one of the simplest ways is just this guided meditation we did at the beginning where you divide the body into three sections, neck about neck or heart up, uh, then the torso or the whole body, and then from about the navel down to the ground or even below. And just spend time, uh, breathe, place your awareness in one of those uh, chambers, and just breathe, become sensitive to the sensations. You can visualize uh, a ball of light uh, expanding and contracting with the breath, and after, and then release any tension that builds and let the breath come naturally. And then move to the next chamber and sense any tension there and then to the lowest chamber and sense any tension there. And then expand and just encompass the whole body with your awareness. And just breathe there, but allow the mind, if it wants to, to center at one point where you feel the breath most prominently, even as you remain aware of the whole field of the body, like a spider at the center of a web feeling the whole web. And then you can just repeat like a dog kind of circling the bed before it lies down. But your home base, if you are getting a bit uh, put off or confused, is just this uh, centered point, um, the whole body with that one point, so that uh, the whole body, but sort of centered at that one point where you feel it most prominently. One issue a lot of Westerners and moderns have is trying to control the breath. And wherever they go in that, uh, paradigm of body scanning or with their own breath, there's this sense of constricting it, like crushing a bird. That's a metaphor the Buddha actually uses. And there's a few ways to avoid this. Um, one is to, the breath and the body are delicate, so don't approach them straight. It's like a cat. You have to kind of let it approach you from the side. 
Um, I don't know how accurate that metaphor is. I saw a cartoon once called, like, how to tell your cat is trying to kill you. And, um, but in this case, just not placing your awareness directly on the breath, but instead go to one of those chambers, lower, upper, middle, and place your awareness on a secondary object, which you can have, like loving kindness, and then just release it. Release the mind there and let it, over a count of maybe 10, just do what it wants to do, trusting that it has, you will let it go to either that sense of loving kindness or what you might find is as soon as you release it, it finds the breath on its own. And the breath isn't forced, but rather uh, calm and nourishing because it's relaxed. You're not clutching it. So uh, you do that and just let it go for a count of about 10. You don't have to count really explicitly, just kind of around 10. And then reestablish and do the exact same thing in the next chamber. Drop awareness down in the lower chamber either on the breath directly or on a sense of loving kindness and then release and just let the breath and the mind find its way naturally to this kind of flowing rhythm and then do the same in the upper chamber and then in the whole body and just let what you may find is the awareness really kind of spirals in until it lands on one point and just letting it stay there. But the point is you're not s forcing yourself to come right to the breath. It's a delicate thing. You're taking a secondary object first, and then you're releasing and just trusting the mind to wander in that domain for a little bit freely. You're trusting. And then you check in after 10 seconds, and, or sorry, 10 breaths or so, and you might find that it's run away, and you're thinking about next year, and that's fine. Then you just bring it back. That's what the mind does. But trying to control it, really thinking of the mind as a child is useful. And you know that if you're constantly following a kid around, like making sure they never stray, never move without your permission, it's a recipe for a very unhappy relationship. So trust the kid a little bit. Put him in the right spot, make sure there's no highways nearby, and then trust that he can or she can uh, find their way to the breath or to loving kindness um, for a few, a few breaths. And what, one, what happens when one does this is this is what it means to become sensitive to the whole body. One comes out of that really having a, an awareness of this entire bodily uh, frame. And, um, and it becomes calm. That fourth step of the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta, one calms the bodily activity, is this uh, process of as that breath naturally begins to massage out the kind of knots of awareness and um, defilement in the, in the subtle body or in the, what do you want to call it, just the breath body. With that as a foundation, the Buddha moves on to uh, the next two uh, ways of cultivating this foundation, which is to cultivate mindfulness of the postures. So sitting, walking, standing, lying down, and um, one maintains mindfulness. And then uh, in all of one's actions, one maintains mindfulness and clear comprehension, sati sampajanya. Um, so when eating and drinking, when moving forward and back, when turning one's head, when extending one's limbs, when chewing, when tasting, when sleeping, when waking up, um, the Buddha lays all these activities out. One maintains mindfulness, one maintains awareness. And this is a, a great comfort because really, what it means is even if we aren't getting as much meditation in our lives as we'd like, even if we don't have time with the job or the family, if you're maintaining the sense of presence, of awareness in your daily life, that is cultivation. You are there for your, uh, for your life, and the heart is learning as you navigate. Um, there's a few really beautiful ways of doing this. Um, because one can become really fixated in a tight way on maintaining mindfulness of every movement. But um, one thing you can do, which someone uh, I know has done, is really try to make every movement as quiet as you can. Um, another is to understand that as practitioners, much of your uh, goal or your practice is to make your life into a work of art. That means the way you walk, the way you eat, the way you speak, 
everything should be a work of art. So how can you do all of these as beautifully as, as possible? How can you bow, not carelessly, but as beautifully as possible? How can you uh, chew, put down your spoon? How can you speak to someone quietly? Um, there are no insignificant actions because every action is a chance to train the heart and bring this sense of mindfulness up. And uh, to have faith that if we, you know, so many of the monastic training rules are about how to develop this artistic, this, this beauty and comportment, and it's real power to develop mindfulness in all postures of the body. And the final three are, uh, oh, before that, uh, sati is often combined with this word sampajanya, which means clear comprehension. And uh, that's the wisdom aspect. It's, uh, I've heard it compared to, it's, you can have mindfulness when you're mopping a floor, but sampajanya, clear comprehension, is knowing where the ba back of the mop is so you don't hit anyone. Or, um, you know, the example of a monk on alms round who is being so mindful of walking, he misses his turn and walks straight out. Clear comprehension, uh, sampajanya, means keeping in mind context and suitability. And then the Buddha goes into the three uh, most unpopular of the Satipatthana, and that's contemplation of the 32 parts of the body, so sort of uh, looking at the body in terms of the constituents' parts, um, the uh, four elements in the body, and the uh, charnel ground contemplations, or seeing what happens when a body decays. And I don't know if we have time to go through all those. No. Um, <laughs> Basically, what these go down to or, or boil down to is there is a, a attachment we have to this body which is not wholesome and which leads to lust and to um, a sort of heat and defilement and a lot of our more unwholesome patterns are wound into the body. And if we can step back and see this body as just what it is, it gives us a chance to really develop a sense of coolness and detachment from this form. And that's a useful tool to have in your tool belt in modern society, which is so rife with sensual invocation and uh, advertising and all these things meant to incite lust. But it's also a profoundly powerful part of the practice, as if one brings in a bit of body contemplation um, learns how to uh, look at the body in terms of just what's actually there, then uh, one can find that we judge people so much by their bodies and we're so fo fixated on our own. The chance to just see the body as a mantle of clay, negative body images comparing your own body to other bodies and assuming your body is less important, this is much different. This is seeing all bodies as just these strange, compilations or composites of calcium, skin, hair. It's fine, but it's, it's just that much. And it equalizes everything. And I remember the first time I started practicing this, um, going to a, a, a mosque, uh, and I, there was just some man kind of huddled uh, against the wall with this sort of old coat. He was very nondescript. And I could sense the subconscious drive to sort of judge and dismiss him by this sort of impoverished ex ex uh, appearance. And yet, um, you know, just subconsciously, I suppose, the, the mind or the eyes kind of skip over people sometimes. And yet, you could see so clearly that what mindfulness of body did and what looking at the body is just another set of clothes was his heart was able to shine through in a way that I could actually see, and it was such a gift to not see him by his body or the clothes, but rather, you know, he was a devout, uh, really, you know, faithful Muslim, as far as, as, far as I know, um, but you could just, as soon as the judgment of the body had been put aside, there was this uh, profound uh, connection and care, and that's the gift that seeing the body is just a body gives. 
I was hoping to go into those more unpopular topics more, but uh, I don't think we'll get a chance. So we'll leave it at that for now. And uh, good luck. Andamayam Dhammakataya Sadhu Karanga Dhammase Sadhu 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 Anumodan So we have a chance for some Q&A now, and if people had things they'd like to discuss or talk about or ask, please just raise your hand. And we'll get a mic to you. And if you can say your name before the question, if you're joining on Zoom or YouTube, you can raise your electronic hand or type your question into the chat. I'm Judith. Um, to can you me hold it closer? Uh, it, the green light is there, so I think it's on. OK. Um, so it seems to me like there's a bit of a rub between the term volitional formation, which implies intention, volitional and intention, and the translation of sankara as programming, which seems mm -hmm. like it's automatic and that intention is not part of it. So can you speak to that, please? That is a great question, Judith. <laughs> One element is the Buddha was um, more of a poet than, uh, than a, how, how would you say, a uh, putting things in spreadsheets. That's what the Abhidhamma came along for um, afterwards. And so Sankara is used in three different contexts. Uh, one is Sankara within the five khandas, uh, which is you know, f form, body, uh, feelings, perceptions, sankhara, volitional formations, and awareness, consciousness, vinyana. And in that sense, it is volitional formations, and um, volition is the key element. So you're right. There's something there very much creating kama, um, and it's a program run by something. Um, yes. Then there's sankhara in the second context, which is all conditioned things. So that's a big category. That's everything but nibbana, awakening. And then there's the third way, which is in the context of the three kinds of sankhara. So uh, vachi sankhara is speech uh, formation, which is like how we talk to ourselves in our heads or externally. Uh, chitta sankhara, which is perception and feeling. And these are conditioners of the mind. Uh, and then um, uh, the third is... Uh, What's the third? Uh, kaya Sangara, so the felt sense of the body. Um, so I'd say in terms of that, that list, uh, Sankara is, um, how do I put it? Uh, operating largely as a conditioner, as, as a program. In the Khandas, it also does act in that programming way as well. At least that's how Longpo Suchitta translates it, and it's true to my experience. But yeah, as to where awareness kicks in there, that's a good question. I think it's hidden in there somewhere. I'm not sure. <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Sankara, basically what Sankara does is it gathers all the other aggregates into constellations of experience, and that can be a program that runs. But one of those, one of those constellations can be an element of mindfulness. And that's where maybe real intention can slip in more. I think if it lacks that, then it's much more sankara in the sense of uh, perception and feeling, more of these passive elements that run on program without the intention. Maybe that's how to parse it out, is by which of those three contexts sankara is being used in. Yeah, it, it's really helpful. Like the Buddha, Long Prapasana said the Buddha didn't teach doctrine. He taught people who are suffering. So he really did use these terms different ways. Um, and sometimes it can be very, it's useful to like try to parse it out, but sometimes 
you know, you find there's a limit to just, it's sort of like these Venn diagrams that kind of fit over each other, but they aren't sharply lined up. And the next two millennia were spent by the Abidama specialists trying to line it all up. <laughs> so only sometimes, but it's useful because like now I'm curious too. And uh, it's a good, qu it's a good question. Yeah. Okay. So I had a question about nostalgia. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm curious as to whether nostalgia tends to be kind of rooted in uh, defilement, or you know, is there good nostalgia, bad nostalgia, um, and how to deal with it? Because I, I don't know, just looking at how my own mind operates. Uh, wanting to get into hobbies that basically turn my living space into a museum. <laughs> I don't know that that's really, that doesn't seem like ultimate freedom. Uh, and yet I fall into these traps of, I don't know, I, it, it does seem to be the kind of joy that's very ephemeral and requires jumping onto the hamster wheel. So uh, just interested in your thoughts on that. <laughs> Yeah, um, good question. I mean, one really useful thing to speak to is uh, just there can be this idea that as we let go of craving and grasping on things that it's you just come to kind of this dryness or, or uh, lack of real sensation um, and kind of become this mindfulness automaton. Um, so I just think really raising up, you know, when Longford Sumedho learned his mother had passed away, he was in the car driving to a retreat, and he, you know, he held the hand of the driver and just sort of cried for a bit, and there's um, poignancy and, uh, what'd you call the, what was the word? Nostalgia, yeah. I think there's a place for poignancy, um, and a level of nostalgia, uh, you know, appreciating the beauty and having gratitude for that which is in, in our past. But, uh, yeah, there's definitely an unwholesome side when one begins to feed on it or when one's attachment to, to objects, um, you know, begins to really accumulate in that way. That's a, a really valid line to parse out. And I think it's just something people have to parse out for themselves, um, what, what the wholesome level of that is. But the Buddha said not to dwell in the past, you know, um, so really taking that to heart as well. And sometimes, but sometimes we need some skillful means to get there. So, you know, taking pictures of the letters which you're throwing away and keeping them on your hard drive or something like that, like you can ease yourself into it. And sometimes you don't know how good it'll feel to be rid of all those objects until you've done it, you know, and, and that's one of the issues. It's, there's a bit of, of faith in terms of leaping off of that, so... Hi, uh, my name is Kate. I would like to um, say something about Sankara, the way I understand it. And it's partly from Bhikkhu Analyo's explanation. Sankara is what was conditioned in the past, and it is conditioning the future. So it, it was prepared or conditioned in the, pa in the past and conditioning for the future. So if you don't have the mindfulness to understand what is going on in the present, you will be run by that AI programming going forward. But if you have the mindfulness and understandings, the Sambhashanya, you can potentially stop the Sankhara going forward into the future and creating a wholesome program going forward, basically. That is my understanding, thank that you. That sounds about right, yeah. Um, and Judith, I mean, it was a really good point, actually. Like, Longpur Suchitta's translated Sankara's programs, and maybe that works for uh, the perception and feeling, like it is these conditioners of the mind. But I think within the context of the khandas, I think you're right, that is where intention and karma is. It All the other khandas are resultants 
uh, Sankara is the, the one causal aggregate that causes comma. So, yeah, it, it can't just be a program, actually, in, in that context, at least. So, yeah, just etch a sketch some of what I said in this talk, please. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I just have one point to add. Um, I, I visited Aya Anantabodi, and one thing that she said is, just ask yourself, how are you meeting the present moment? You know, just when you go about your day, just ask yourself, how are you meeting the present moment? Because um, your mind can go everywhere, right? So if you meet the pr present moment, then you can basically reprogram the Sankara. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's good. It's like having a, yeah, we could keep going with an AI metaphor, but it's having the human feedback in there. Um, <laughs> But, you know, Bhante Nali also says the body, in terms of the khandas, body is, uh, in these locuses of identity, body is where we are, feelings is how we feel, uh, perceptions is what we perceive, sankhara is why we act, and uh, consciousness, vijnana, is whereby we experience. So, yeah, let's think about that for the next 20 years together. <laughs> so. I think we have room for another question. Uh, on Zoom, please, person on Zoom. Who? Kieran. So I was kind of with the meditation today. Um, I notice sometimes when I do more body-focused meditations, not always breath ones, that um, I'll have headaches start. Like, And um, headaches are interesting and pain is interesting because I feel like it always, it's the thing that can really easily draw you into other levels of awareness, uh, disliking it, how you feel about it, and so forth. And I, you know, I'm, I'm able to sort of watch the sensations, but sometimes I feel like I can run myself in circles, and I don't know if it's better to further engage with it or try to move to some other object. And I don't know if you have any advice for that sort of thing. Thank you. Are your, uh, is your breath meditation mainly uh, based on the, the tip of the nose or a certain part of the body? Um, depends. Um, I try different things. Sometimes the stomach. Um, and sometimes the whole body. I, I tend to kind of go cross-eyed if I focus on my nose. So, uh, yeah. Um. Yeah, no, no, great, great question. Um, I think one thing that's really uh, useful is, you know, that's a very common experience uh, if one is trying to focus just on one point and right off the bat. And I find that's just because we have so much energy to do going into meditation that if it's like trying to focus all that intense rushing river through a teeny, you know, aperture and uh, the tension just builds up. Um, so I think really cultivating an active approach to breath meditation through the body scan or if, if not a body scan, then uh, another active meditation like uh, a metta, loving kindness meditation before you come to the breath because then you're when you do come to the breath, you have a lighter touch. Some of that pressure and momentum from the day has been bled off. Um, and the, uh, the other thing, though, is um, if you, uh, what was I going to say? If you, um, sometimes the breath really is delicate and instead of placing awareness directly on the breath, I usually recommend people have a secondary object. So a secondary, it's like ri rice, a good plate of rice, that's your breath, that, that's always there. But you need curry. So like, is your curry loving kindness? That's a really good basis. Or if people have cultivated the sound of silence, the, the sort of nada sound, a subtle hissing below the auditory landscape, that's a really good secondary. Um, but by allowing your mind to have both to kind of work with, it just gives it a little less pressure in it. And then the first thing you can come to when you check in isn't directly back to the breath, which can be a lot, but rather back to that secondary. And then you kind of release it, the awareness, and just let the breath come to you. Um, so that's why, you know, get a good secondary, like loving kindness, a sense of friendliness, and come back to that. But then implicitly kind of have this intention to let the breath come up and to just allow that to happen. And then after about 10 breaths or so, then just let yourself come 
uh, come back to, you know, recheck in and make sure you haven't wandered too far. But I, I'd say that's a really good indirect approach. Um, and the other is, yeah, that placing awareness lower on the body can be helpful for people who have uh, that intensity in the head. And skillful uh, expedient means before you sit, like walking meditation or yoga or qigong or a cold shower can be helpful. Um, a really good book is Breathing Like a Buddha by Ajahn, Tenis, or Ajahn Suchito. Uh, it's online. Um, was that, did that address your question at all? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, helpful. Great. I do think uh, we have to wrap stuff up today. So.